Hey guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. My name is Oriel and today I've got a positive video for you guys for a change. We are talking about makeup brands that I actually do care about. Brands that release really interesting things or things that are compelling to me, things that I'm interested in trying. And if that sounds interesting to you, please keep on watching. We're getting into it right now. If anyone has ever had Milkis, let me know because I didn't know this was a drink until this year and it's so good. It's kind of like if Calpico and cream soda had a baby. All right, so this video comes in no particular order, so don't take the list in which I'm telling you guys to be indicative in any way, shape, or form to be how much I care about the brands. So let's jump right in. The first brand I have on this list is Jill Stewart. Now, Jill Stewart Beauty is a collaboration between a I think native Japanese makeup company and the American fashion house designer Jill Stewart and they've come together to create what I can only describe as Sailor Moon makeup. It is actually incredible what they're able to create. Um, spoiler alert, I actually finally did buy some Jill Stewart makeup because there was an amazing sale, their new collection released, and I really wanted to finally review it for my channel and share some information about this very elusive brand. I have, in the many years since I've been following Jill Stewart's brand on the internet, seen very, very little information released by mainstream beauty bloggers, vloggers, what have you, on American or, you know, English-speaking channels. It's very hard to find this kind of stuff. It's actually hard to find, period, I feel like. Um, for a really long time, I've been scouring the internet and watching one-off videos from, like, Singapore or Japan. I wanted to review Jill Stewart Beauty through an American YouTuber lens on the complexion and on the face with the features of someone who is Asian because honestly, it's a very particular niche to be in um, and I wanted to do that. So Jill Stewart is a brand that I am compelled to try, not just because what they create is beautiful, but also because their packaging is just stunning. It's everything I could have wanted from a brand. I feel like if I were able to create a brand from the bottom up with a dream team, things that could execute literally every single last want and detail of my dreams, I feel like it would be the Jill Stewart line in its entirety, basically. So Jill Stewart is very interesting to me. Next brand I have is Kaleidos. Kaleidos is one that is extra interesting to me because they are an indie brand based in Taiwan, I believe, and that is super cool. Um, Kaleidos, for those of you who don't know, they've created the Escape Pod collection, the Futurism collection. They have these beautiful mini palettes that are kind of a curation of single shades. And then that really neon one from the summer 2020. And they've just released a new collection and everything they create is absolutely stunning. I feel like I am rooting for them on a personal level because they are Asian run and, you know, it's indie and they finally broke it into a Western market, which I feel like is usually very separated. It's very much so, from my perspective, there's very much so K-beauty, Eastern beauty, beauty from China and beauty from Korea and Japan. And then there's some of it that trickles into mainstream Western makeup, but not in the way that Kaleidos has infiltrated. And that is super cool to me. The way that Kaleidos is being spoken about in the mainstream YouTube beauty sphere for us here in the Western Hemisphere is something that other brands I don't think have gotten yet. And so that is super cool. And of course, the packaging and their whole artistic direction is very interesting to me. Next, I have Lingoss and Sona G, not for their makeup, but for their brushes. So as some of you may know, I am a sucker for Fude, or Japanese handmade brushes. They are absolutely incredible. Now, I know Fude doesn't actually mean that, but in the makeup world, that's how we refer to them as. They are freaking awesome. <laughs> They're really incredible. There's something very, very luxurious about having a handmade Japanese makeup brush, things that have been bundled by hand, that are lacquered with natural lacquer on, you know, wooden handles that have been crafted, and it's just an incredible experience. Sonuji is a visionary and an artist whose work I support wholeheartedly. I buy almost every release that she makes just because I I love her work. I mean, I've, I've described her work as being stuff that I don't ask for but that I eventually need. It's kind of like the Apple mentality, which is so funny, but, you know, Apple is all about you know, moving forward, modernism, trying to make things as sleek and compact as possible, whereas her work of bringing Japanese food into the hands of regular consumers and not just makeup artists, I feel like it's the opposite. It's about tradition, it's about artistry, it's about things that are not all about bang for buck, but just about slowing down and appreciating the finer things in life. Once you start to get into the rabbit hole that is looking at food, looking at all kinds of Japanese lacquerware and all kinds of beautiful handcrafted artisan work, you really start to get suckered in. And I don't consider myself to be a completionist at all, but I do feel like with Sony G brushes, I am starting to feel that completionist itch just a tiny little bit. Next one I have is KVD, Vegan Love Beauty, or whatever it's called. <laughs> KVD, Vegan Love, World Love Hippie Beauty, as Smith Pillow likes to say. Um, but I'm interested in this brand because I'm interested in Kat Von D. I was, at least, as a child. I felt like 
you know, she was just a, such a talented artist and had such a vision for makeup when she was the one spearheading her brand. And we know that it fell off the wayside a little bit even prior to the vaccine problems. But I feel like once she relayed her vaccine stance, um, she was in the middle of the Lolita phase. I feel like Lolita was just really coming out as the color of the brand. And then, you know, we all had to cancel that brand for personal or moral reasons. And I did too. But now that she's no longer affiliated with the company, I am curious to see what they're coming out with. They came out with these beautiful blushes. I feel like the range is very much so pared back right now. If you go to Sephora, there's not much going on. But they do have these beautiful blushes, the compacts, the packaging, still as beautiful as ever. I feel like they've really continued on her artistic legacy, her artistic image, while making it accessible for us without having to line her pockets. And I remember watching a Hannah video in which she said that um, it feels very, very disingenuous to try to package up uh, goth culture or, you know, that, that kind of aesthetic into something so clean cut, something that Kenzo can just bottle up and sell because it just doesn't feel right. And I have to say I agree with her. I do think that's true. But at the same time, <laughs> the person in me who likes beautiful aesthetic things just appreciates the fact that you can get a rose compact. Like that's just freaking awesome. So as much as I <laughs> don't want to overthink it and I don't want to feel like I'm a poser for enjoying Kat Von D, I also enjoy Kat Von D and, you know, it is what it is. The next three are just going to be luxury fashion houses that have makeup brands. So I have Gucci, Dior, and Chanel together. That's just because I am a bougie bitch and I really like nice makeup. I really like things that are very, very luxe luxury. I feel like if I were to make this YouTube channel 10 years into the future, it would just be a luxury YouTube channel. I wouldn't review anything drugstore or high end even. I'm just going to lump them all together because they have this very, I guess, interesting difference and similarity within them. So in terms of Dior and Chanel, they have rich histories with me. So Dior is a brand that I've always really liked as a kid, just because I felt like of all of the luxury fashion houses that were prominent, Dior was the one that I personally really enjoyed. It's very girly, very feminine, very just traditionally cute. Um, the only other brand that I feel like is as cute or girly as Dior might be Miu Miu, but Miu Miu doesn't have a makeup line. If Miu Miu had a makeup line, <laughs> it is over, fellas. This would just be a Miu Miu makeup channel. But anyway, I feel like Dior is as close to Miu Miu as we can get. Um, it's a very cutesy, girly, um, frolicking in the flowers aesthetic, and I love that. Chanel is different. Chanel is a brand that I've kind of aspired to be. Chanel is my fantasy woman in a brand. So very forward-thinking. You know, Coco has been such an icon for women for many, many years. Forward-thinking, innovative, classic, a modern beauty, a minimalist beauty, subtle, understated, and that's not me at all, but it's who I want to be. And then Gucci is kind of some freak hybrid of the two, very much so like ostentatious, but also very cool and like don't care what you think, but also on high fashion. It, it's it's modern, it's hip, but it's also feminine, it's also cool, it's also non-binary, like it's it's very different from all, all of the others. And so I feel like of these three luxury fashion houses that make makeup, I kind of aspire to be a little bit of each. And that's why I'm intrigued by what they release. Not to mention that their products are great. So Dior's makeup products have received great accolade, especially their highlights and their blushes. Um, Chanel, I so far have, have been loving Chanel. I've only had the blush from Chanel, but the blush is fabulous. And trust you me, I want a lot of their stuff, including their fall winter for 2020. That red, that juicy red collection is absolutely breathtaking. Um, and also Gucci has released some really cool stuff. I really wanted the bronzer for a while, but you guys have brought it to my attention that the bronzer compact is actually not very luxurious, and so she's out. But um, I do like their lipsticks, and I do like their mascara. So they are all brands that I'm keeping an eye out for. Likely lashes. So likely makeup um, because of Jordi. So Jordi on YouTube at It's Likely Makeup. Super, super talented artist. She created a lash brand, or it's a makeup brand, but specifically, I like the lashes. So the lashes, because they are super interesting in shape and size, they are not your mother's eyelash company, honestly. I feel like if you took Kiss Lashes, House of Lashes, Ardell Lashes, like, you know, I lure any kind of regular eyelash company, and you mixed all the lash styles in a bag, and you pulled them out, you wouldn't be able to really tell which one is which. You know, they don't really have a signature look. But the Likely Lashes, Jordi's brand, they are so unique, so distinct in style, in color, in shape and texture and all that stuff. They are just juicy, interesting lashes. They're so unique and different. They have a brand of their own, a voice of their own, a story of their own. And I love how just graphic and cartoony they look. They're not meant to be traditionally beautifying in like the, you know, silky, minky lash way. They're meant to be like very artistic. I feel like they are an artistic tool. And they're pricey. I mean, not that they're pricey per se, it's just that I'm stingy with eyelashes. I buy like the bundle packs that are like $2 a lash. 
it would be difficult for me to fork over the money to spend on lashes. But if I were to buy lashes at full price, I feel like they would be from Jordy's brand because I'm always interested to see what kinds of styles they put out. It's so against the norm. It's so interesting, so graphic, so cartoony, and I love that vibe. Next two brands I'm interested in are the opposite of Coconut Oil Chic, which are Curewise and Lila B. So I mentioned in the brands I'm not interested in video, I'll link it above, um, about Tower 28 and I think Kosas because I said that they're very much so like that coconut oil with a drop of pigment brand. And I said I wasn't into that kind of thing. And yet here we are with Lila B and Kira Weiss. What are the differences? Honestly, I feel like it might come down to the amount of pigmentation from this stuff. I mean, I'm not exactly positive, but um, from what I can tell, it looks like Lila B products and Kira Weiss products are not as balmy as Tower 28 and as um, Kosas. Those two brands literally just look like oil slicks, and I cannot do that to my face, whereas Cure Wise is still very dewy, very rich, but it looks sophisticated, classy, doesn't look like grease on the skin. And I feel like Lila B very much so leans kind of almost on the satin side. So those are two brands that are just very, very compelling to me. And also we cannot take away image and branding and packaging. Just those two have awesome, awesome images, awesome packaging, awesome design. The Lila B Pebble is so stunning, so gorgeous. I wonder if they would consider making refillable packaging because the compact itself is so heavy. It's like a block of stone. I can't imagine that you know they would prefer for you to continue buying that over and over again over refilling a little compact. And the fact that Cure Weiss has created a product that has such a cult following, such a, a loyal fan base for all of the cream products that are clean, they're you know gunk free, and they have such sustainable packaging. You know she does two different kinds of reusable packaging. She does a metal one and she does a cardboard one and both are super awesome. There's no plastic in any of the packaging she sends. Everything is paper-based. Good on you, Cure Weiss. And I know she's been doing this for some time, so I know that this isn't a greenwashing campaign and I feel like that is what a environmentally conscious brand looks like. I mean, we all know that makeup is already superfluous. There's no reason to get on your high horse about makeup and, you know, trying to be this, that, and the other about the environment. But when you are a brand like Cure Weiss, and that is the cornerstone of how you are developing things, not just to get a quick buck, not just to sell your product as an environmentally friendly alternative or just to put on the packaging, that is just the ethos of her brand, right? It is at the cornerstone of how she's created her company. And for that reason, I feel like I really have to give, you know, props to her, I have to take my hat off to her because that is... You know, something quite visionary for when she created her company. Next, I have Gucci Atelier, which in a similar vein is all about class and me wanting to be that kind of woman. <laughs> me wanting to be like Gucci because she is super cool, super chic, super effortless. There is a teacher at my school who reminds me of her. Um, just so cool and full of life. So worldly and chic without trying. And Gucci's makeup brand is that. And it's that plus a whole lot of money, so there's prestige behind it. And yeah, I will just leave some of her products up here to show you guys. The iPods, the little lip suede, the little multi-sticks, everything that Gucci Atelier makes is just a work of art. It's a sculptural work of art, and it's also makeup that looks functional and practical for every day. So that is another brand that I always have one year to the ground for. I don't hear a lot of people talking about Westman Atelier. Sorry, did I say Gucci Atelier this whole time? Westman Atelier, run by Gucci Westman, um, a brand that I'm very interested in. Next we have Charlotte Tilbury. Charlotte Tilbury is a brand that just gets me because the brand gets me. <laughs> there is something just so lovely about her whole color scheme, which is very much so in a rosy pinky tone. It is kind of like the NARS orgasm, but like the Charlotte Tilbury version, and I just stinking love it. The two colors that are my favorite, Walk of Shame and Pillow Talk, and guess what? Has incredible collections, Pillow Talk and Walk of Shame. I know they renamed it to Walk of No Shame, but the eye pots, the quads, the blushes, everything that she releases is just so dreamy. I feel like Charlotte Tilbury's brand is all about this dreamy, dreamy, like, fairy tale world. <laughs> and honestly, I could have an entire collection of Charlotte Tilbury, and I wouldn't mind it. Honestly, the only thing that I mind is that all of her packaging looks the same, so you have to, like, pick everything up and, like, check to see, like, what's inside. But amazing, amazing, amazing. I think her products are just very practical for the everyday woman, for the everyday person who wants to just look polished and gorgeous for the everyday. I have a couple of her things, and they've never let me down, honestly. And I feel like if I ever want something that's just going to work, Charlotte Tilbury is usually a brand that I can get it from. Yeah, she really leans into what works and people are kind of sick and tired of her not innovating, her not doing new things, but at the same time, what she's doing is compelling to the average person. And she does innovate from time to time. It's not that often, it's not that frequent, but when she does, it does become a cult favorite. And I feel like I'd rather her take her time and flesh out a collection for those of us who really enjoy it. 
I really, really like the Walk of Shame collection, and I think that it really sets my skin tone. It's really quite a gorgeous color, and I like that she's built kind of a capsule collection around colors that are successful, because yes, you could see it as a cash grab, but you could also see it as listening to people when they tell you that this thing has really worked for them. So for that reason, I love Charlotte Tilbury products. I also feel like they're very good. And although some of it is overpriced, you're paying for the whole experience, darling. So I do love C. Tilbury. This list is really, really long, so I'm going to keep going. We're going to go a little bit faster. The next one I have is M Cosmetics. Now, Michelle Fawn, OG YouTuber, she is honestly my personal hero because not only was she a OG makeup YouTuber, she was also Asian, and we didn't see much of that. You know, representation is so important. And, you know, Michelle also was an entrepreneur. I don't want to say was. Michelle was very open about her being an entrepreneur, an artist, a makeup artist, you know, um, being someone who just wore many hats. And I have to say, I admire her makeup artistry. I admire her talent. I admire her, you know, trying to do something new. But I also admire the fact that, like, she never stays in one place too long. She's always looking ahead. She's always doing the next best thing. And when she had her first failed makeup line, with uh, Lancome or whatever parent company was with Lancome, she created M Cosmetics the first time. And it was a total flop. I remember she had the day palette with like the tiny little to-go thing. I actually bought that. I asked for it for a birthday gift or something like that, and it was a while ago. Honestly, that life palette was absolute trash. It was terrible, and we all knew it. But it was the best thing that she could make at the time, and I feel like at the time when makeup was being created, um, that was the thing that was cool. It was very innovative for that time because we didn't really have a lot of big bulky palettes that could also break it down into smaller things. So you can really see there how Michelle was innovating at her level within her jurisdiction. But she tried again and I think that was really freaking awesome that she got up and she tried to do it herself all with her own money. And so M Cosmetics 2.0, the one that we know now, that one is the one that she's very clearly working hard to build from the ground up. Products are being released very slowly. Things like the lip cushions, the serum blushes, the eyeliners, the brow things. It's not an, a huge pile of stuff being thrown in because it's not a huge team. And I love how she shows us the campaign shots, how she shows, you know, Mrs. Robot, you know, working on the photography and the videography. It's just so awesome. It's just so cool to see her be successful. It's so cool to see what kinds of things she's cooking up. And, you know, the fact that she just shows us some of the prototypes and samples that come through her office. I just think kudos to you, Michelle. Um, I've never purchased from M Cosmetics just because I'm waiting for the right moment to get a bunch of things at once. It might be Black Friday, I don't know. But they are a brand that is constantly, constantly <laughs> battling for my dollar because I I have this personal collect connection, at least I feel, to Michelle Vaughn and I have a personal investment in her brand. And so M Cosmetics is definitely one that I'm always checking for. ColourPop, ColourPop, Color Mom, my lifeblood. ColourPop, ColourPop might be my favorite brand of all time just because it's accessible, it's cheap, and their products are stinking amazing. And, you know, I never condone buying more makeup than you need, but I do feel like because they release so much, you can always find something that is right for you. And that is why I love ColourPop. Not because they release things like crazy and I want you to collect every single thing that they release, but amongst all their crazy releases, there's bound to be something that works for you and there's bound to be something that you like because their formulas are so dang good. They create good products at an affordable price point for everyone. And I think that is what's really nice about ColourPop. I cannot speak to 4th Ray Beauty, I can't speak to Soul Body, but in terms of their mainstay products, ColourPop's products are freaking great. I love their eyeshadows, I love their lip color, I love their brow products, I love basically anything that goes on the face, any kind of color cosmetics, I have not gone wrong, not been led awry, not been led astray, not a single flop, honestly, from their brand. I know I'm sounding like a major simp right now for them, but it's true. It's because I'm simping hard for ColourPop. They're so freaking amazing. It's kind of the way that they encourage YouTubers to create content three or four times a week because even if someone doesn't watch all four of your videos, if they come back at least once a week, that's more view time than you would have gotten just releasing one video a week for the whole year. And I feel like that's the whole model, right? No one's asking people to buy every single product and every single collection they release because that's crazy. People cannot keep up with that. Their model is a fast fashion model, but for makeup. And so for anyone to say, slow down ColourPop, like they don't have an obligation to. That's not their business model. What you get as a consumer is the choice to pick and choose what is best for you. You just sit back and you wait and you pick up things that you like, you leave things that you don't, you get a quality product for an affordable price point and I think that is just so awesome. They're also very on top of trends and I'm not suggesting we all go out and support things that are maybe unethically produced or that we overconsume beyond our means and then it expires and it goes bad, whatever. There's a whole slew of issues with overconsumption and so I'm trying to not fangirl too hard on that because it's irresponsible, but I do want to recognize that ColourPop serves a very, very important service for us in the makeup industry for those of us who don't want to be spending top dollar for things that are 
marginally better um, because Colourpop really does it. It does it for me. <laughs> I am always, always curious about what they're releasing and honestly, try as you might, you cannot avoid the new releases from Colourpop anyway. Ooh, next one I have is a brand that I'm interested in but will probably never buy from and that is Glossier. Glossier is another one of those low effort, beautiful, model-esque, beautiful woman on the beach brands. It basically is reliant on you being a model already and then just slapping a tiny, tiny bit of product on top. And a lot of you guys agreed with me in my comments saying that things like that are not worth your money because it's basically a bunch of nothing that you pay full price for. The only one <laughs> thing that people contested me on were sheer balmy products, so sheer lip products. And honestly, guys, I know I was trying to be a little bit inflammatory in that video, but I got what I wanted, you guys roasted me. I concede that sheer lip products can be helpful, but that doesn't explain why I'm drawn to Glossier. Glossier is a brand that's been around the block a couple times, she's not new anymore. Um, and so honestly, the novelty of the brand should have worn off by now, but they haven't. There's still something untouchable. There's still a je ne sais quoi about the brand that I really can't put my finger on. And yet, whenever they release a new product, I'm always on the page to see. Something that keeps me looking, keeps me coming back, wondering if I can ever be that girl. And I'm never that girl. Um, try as I might, I can never be that girl. But there's something about Glossier that makes me feel empowered to act like one. The next one I have is Pat McGrath. Now, Pat McGrath is a brand that I'm interested in solely for the artistry of the legend herself, mother, Pat McGrath. I did not know that she had such a history, and trust you me, if you're someone who was like, I didn't know who Pat McGrath was until I got on YouTube either, um, joined the club, I didn't either. I just didn't grow up in an age where I was really looking at who did the makeup artistry in the magazines, and I just didn't know. I didn't know better. Of course, now that I look through my Pinterest and I actually check some of the photos that I've kept, I can actually see that Pat McGrath was the makeup artist for some of these very, very influential runway designs, but stop yelling at me. I didn't know at the time, um, but now I do know Pat McGrath uh, has launched this brand, and I feel very, very lucky that I live in the States where we can get Pat McGrath and Sephora fairly easily, and it's very accessible. I think what she makes is truly artistic, truly wonderful, and um, based on her influential work in the makeup industry, it's about time that she started her own brand, and I'm happy that she has been slowly but surely putting out things that are right for different groups of people, right for different tastes in makeup. She's created like balms and, you know, liquid highlights and things that are stretching, you know, her brand little by little. And that is always interesting to see. I'm so curious to see what her holiday collection is going to look like this year. Every year, uh, I've traditionally purchased a little thing from the holiday collections because, you know, usually there's just something so magical about getting Pat McGrath on the holidays. And so I'm so curious to see what she's bringing in this year. I hope it matches my color scheme. Um, again, Pat has a very fine eye for color and she likes all kinds of color and she's already run the gambit with the rose thing and so I feel like she's not going to do much pink anymore. I have really, you know, I, I dug in full force with pink when she was releasing it and everyone was like, no more pink, no more rose. And uh, it was like, I'm going to get it while I can because eventually that pink is going to go away and it's going to be replaced with something else. And she likes her blues, she likes her golds. And I feel like at this point, I can personally take a back seat from Pat McGrath and just enjoy her releases from afar because I feel like I have enough of a collection from her brand that suit my needs, suit my taste, and things that she releases like brow products or clear balms. Those are not really in my wheelhouse. They're not really what I'm interested in particularly, but I can see it from afar, appreciate it from afar, and, you know, say snaps for growing, um, growing your brand, Pat. Last two brands, and then I'm going to end because it looks like my camera cannot record any longer. Lime Prime and Too Faced. Now, I feel a little bit embarrassed saying these two brands because they've both been embroiled in scandal. Um, Too Faced, literally just because they make really cute things. Do I feel good supporting that company? Absolutely not. So do I only buy them from TJ Maxx? Absolutely. <laughs> I literally only buy Too Faced when it is discount um, or when I feel like, yeah, that's it. I actually haven't bought anything from their site full price. Um, so I don't feel terrible about that. And then Lime Prime because their stuff is freaking gorgeous. Honestly, I feel like there's something special about the Lime Prime design. Lime Prime color story. What they put together is just slightly out of the comfort zone of most, but they make it in a way that's fun and interesting. And the thing about Lime Prime is that their formulas are so freaking good. Their products are objectively very, very good. And I tried them out a little bit from, you know, the discount stores from TJ Maxx and Marshalls. And then after that, I started buying from them, like at Ulta and stuff like that. And their products are really freaking amazing. Very, very good. Very impressive. You've heard me talk ad nauseum about their palettes because their palettes are awesome. Um, and I just can't wait to try more from their brand. I am drowning in makeup, and so I cannot be in good conscience trying out different things from their brand, but um, 
if given the chance, I would absolutely love to try more lines. I always feel like I'm looking at what they're releasing because I want to know what kinds of things they're putting out. I'm also curious to see how the new um, the new CEO or the new president has taken line crime, if they are kind of keeping in line with what Doe Deer would have wanted, or if I feel like it is congruent with what you know, she's doing now in Mexico. I believe she's living in Mexico in like this house that she's renovated, that she's redesigned herself. She's now doing fine jewelry. Like she has her own jewelry line. It's really interesting. I used to follow her on Instagram, so I might pop up a couple pictures just to show you guys what's going on. But you know, it's it's no question that Dodir, as weird and Nazi costume wearing as she was, um, she is a very artistic woman. And she has such a fine eye for creativity and beauty and all things eclectic and just slightly off kilter, but still very, very cool. And so I'm constantly trying to, you know, measure how well the brand is doing now without her with what the image of Doe Deer is today living in her regular life and do they kind of line up? Because it's always interesting when a creative person creates a brand, spearheads it with these certain ideals or this message or, you know, this certain ethos or brand identity, and then they leave the company. Will the company continue to go in that direction that they were trying to go in, or do they kind of clean up the act? And so far, I feel like line crime has changed a little bit. They're a little bit more norm core. They're not as edgy. They're not as innovative in, in what they used to create. Um, and they're not as trend-setting as they used to be. I feel like for a while, line crime was like, the first Anastasia, like they were kind of the them and Sugar Pill, I remember as being like really, really big players in the indie makeup world, making some major shifts that other companies responded to. And I don't really see that so much anymore, but I do see still a very cool and aesthetic brand that I'm interested in. So that was it. Oh my God, I feel like I've been talking for a million years. Thank you for watching and let me know what brands you are interested in. They don't have to be brands that you buy from. I actually don't buy from any of these brands. They're just brands that I keep up appearances with. Like I'm checking their IG. I'm seeing what other people are saying about their products. And so it doesn't have to be brands that you actually spend money on. That will be an entirely separate video of mine, um, if that's interesting, or brands that I am interested in but haven't spent money on. It doesn't really matter. Let me know what brands you are checking in on to see what they're making, what their IG looks like, what kinds of products hit the shelves. I'm so curious to know which ones are your triggers in terms of having your interest peaked. So that would be fun to hear about. Don't forget guys to subscribe to my channel for more makeup and makeup related commentary. I'm so excited to have you guys join me. I love you and I will see you very, very soon. Bye.